I'm Michael Pernforce and this is Open Mic. Uh, today I have the pleasure to welcome one of the true legends of our game of tennis, Mr. Mats Villander. Mats, how are you doing, my friend? Michael, I am doing very well, thank you. Um, it's nice to see you. Um, obviously, we haven't seen each other for a long time because of these strange times, but uh, this is uh, better than um, being just on the phone to see your face, Michael. Well, it's good to see you too, my friend. And, uh, you know, we're going to jump straight into it here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, practice. Uh, you know, you had some very early success, uh, meaning that you uh, played at a very high level uh, as a junior. Uh, what did you see as, as a perfect practice for you? Um, well, I think it was, uh, for me personally, a perfect practice would be to definitely end by playing some points uh, and end the practice by playing uh, not just points first to 10 or 20 or whatever, but actually play points the way we count uh, proper tennis scoring with love 15, 15 all, play games. Uh, and a perfect practice would be to play against somebody that I didn't mind losing to in practice that gave me the opportunity to do a few different things to try and obviously still win the practice, but not to the expense of not trying a few different things. And for me, that would be come to the net once in 15 minutes, uh, rather than not at all for two hours, uh, go for a set, go for a first serve more often than I would in a match. Cause I don't want to hit second serve. So a little more relaxed in terms of the tactics, a little more relaxed in terms of the execution of the shot, but still trying to keep the um, trying to keep my mindset towards winning, even though I wasn't playing the same way I would if the match would mean something. It's that, uh, and I think that's a great attitude to have. And I also like the fact that you're talking about this that you you play the the real points, uh, and it's not just a, a question of drilling. Do, do you feel like that anything changed then when you turned pro? Did you did you train a, in a different way or did you kind of keep that attitude um no i think it changed uh it changed daily i think there were certain situations where you would be um we would schedule a practice with uh well with you or uh, you walk in new storm somebody who was a good friend and you know you're going to play two sets or even three sets in davis cup and then you're trying to win but but then there were times when you were had a day off between uh, two Grand Slam matches and you want to play some points because you want to serve and you play four games or six games. And then it really didn't matter who won the practice. But so I think there were times when uh, in Davis Cup, then I wanted to play points. I wanted to try and win. I wanted to feel like I deserve to play one of the singles matches. But then in, in Grand Slam, I'm, I won my first round. So I'm going to play my second round in two days. So today, the day off, I want to hit for 20 minutes. I want to play a few points and then those days maybe not play uh, the, the regular tennis scoring but just play you know six points each on serve just to do the points thing but so i think it changed every day it, it definitely changed depending on who you were practicing against i think that was the most important some guys you just hate to lose to even in practice and some guys you knew you couldn't beat in practice, like Anders Jarud. If he tried, he would always beat me in practice. And, uh, and I was okay with losing to him, but I was really not wanting to uh, have that attitude of it's okay to lose to Anders. I knew I would lose, but I was trying to push myself to, to care enough where I turned it into a real match. But, so I think it changed. I think it depends. That's why I think the practice partner you have is really important. And, and to have the right partner for the right drill session or the right hour or two hours of practice is key when you're going to yeah. be a better player. You got to yeah. pick, uh, pick the time, pick the moment of what you do with who on the other side of the net. And I, and I think that's so true. And, I, and you talked about you and I practicing and, I, and I'm, and I know that uh, we've had some great practices. Uh, we've also had some practices that were not that great. <laughs> but I think that one of the things that we realized very early and we're taught that even when you don't feel good, you need to make the best out of a practice to actually benefit from going out there and maybe not feeling your best because you're not playing bad or you're not feeling great. And I, and I think that's also very important. I, I think that's the great, I think that's the, the, the skill that the best players in the world 
have is that they go and practice and I actually, it doesn't matter how bad they feel. I think they feel like they just improved a little bit. And sometimes you improve by 1%, sometimes you improve by less, but I think they always find a way to feel like this practice meant something and I actually improved whatever it was, attitude, footwork, forehand, backhand, but I did improve on something. Yeah. Every yeah, time, every practice session. So do you feel that now you're, you're still uh, out there watching, uh, you know, juniors, you're watching the professional practice. Is there something there that you see that, uh, that you did back in the day that maybe players aren't doing today that you feel that could be brought back into practice today? Well, I, yes, I do. I, had, I did some work at a, at a tennis academy outside of uh, Washington, D.C., and I was trying to run some practices where you have to serve and volley on your first serve. Uh, and the returner has to take the second serve and, and take the return and hit it and come in afterwards. And then on top of that, I want you to try and win the set. I want you to try and win as much today as you do when you play the same player uh, in a real match. It is no difference. I want you to try and win. Even though you're hitting only slice backhands, let's say, I still want you to try and win. And they had a very hard time uh, trying to emotionally be uh, in enough involved where they felt that winning was important. And the excuse was, well, I would never play like this. If I played them in a real match, I would never play this way. I'm like, well, that, that's irrelevant. You might have to one day because you can't hit a two-handed backhand because you have something wrong with your left wrist. Are you then not going to practice? And I think Robin Söderling, the great former Swedish player, uh, was part of our Davis Cup team for a while and he couldn't play singles because he couldn't hit a two-handed backhand and he and I asked him to come and practice anyway it's like well I can't play you know points but they're only going to hit to my backhand so they're going to hit to your backhand I want you to come and hit slice backhands and give the opponent your teammate a chance to beat you by going to your backhand and you are going to suck it up and you're going to try and win with a slice backhand and what happened to him is is obvious he got, became a much much better player defensively because he tried really hard by winning with a slice backhand. He learned oh, how to yeah. hit a slice backhand. He learned how to play defense. So I think it's the attitude. Now, is that a general attitude of the general uh, junior population? Or is it the attitude of the players that become really good? I don't know. That I don't know. I think the players that become really good and they actually push their potential to the best, to the highest limit, I think they might be doing this uh naturally from the beginning but it's something the coaches need to stress more too many juniors get nothing out of practice because they didn't feel good yeah yeah i think that that's a good point i think that the talent players they experiment by nature yes, they, exactly. they go out there and, and they want to create and they want to figure things out whereas maybe some don't and they're just you know they're just waiting to be told exactly what to do yeah uh, so you've kind of answered my next question here we i'm talking about different practice partners. Uh, so you then say that, well, you know, I would be willing to maybe go out and practice with somebody that I might not be fond of or not the way they play, but I needed to play against that kind of game to, to improve my own game. So then uh, my next question would be, who is the best practice partner you ever had and why? Oh, I think uh, in general, my best practice partner was Joachim Nyström. Because we practiced a lot, we were obviously, or are, uh, very good, close friends. Uh, and I uh, felt that I could most probably beat him um, seven, eight times out of ten on tour when things really matter. Um, and so I, I had two choices in practice with him. I could decide that, okay, I'm not losing today to him in practice either. Or I had this, well, I don't really care. Uh, I want to work on a few things. And if, if Joke beats me, it's good for his confidence. And he realizes that if I can beat Mats in practice, I can most probably go ahead and win my match tomorrow against somebody who's not as good as I was or as highly ranked. So I think with when you play with somebody that is that good a friend, that has that kind of game, that Nystrom had a very clean game and you, had, you, you found great rhythm hitting against yeah. him, uh, against you, you, yeah, I found that I had to, if you have such great variation, and then that was a different practice. So then I had, I had maybe a little more time, but I had to be more precise with my feet and more precise with, with watching the ball hit the middle of my racket. Because if I didn't, your topspin would send my ball into the fence. Whereas with Jocke, 
uh, I was more, uh, it was easier to hit against him. I was more worried about my own technique, my complete technique in, in stepping into the ball, taking the ball a little bit earlier, uh, cleaning up my spinny kind of forehand a little bit and hitting it a little flatter, which is what I needed to work on always. So I think it, it all depends. But, but Jokke, I think, in general, was the guy that in, understood me the most in practice. I understood him. We had no hang-ups about winning or losing. We had no hang-ups about really trying really hard to, to kick his butt because I don't want to lose to him now that he hasn't won a match on tour for a couple of weeks and I've been winning two tournaments. I'm not going to lose to him in practice. I don't want to do that. Or the other way around. So I think that, yeah, that yeah. Uh, yeah, my best partner was definitely him in practice because we understood each other's game often on the court. Yeah, no, I, I love to see you guys practice. Uh, I mean, it was, it was almost like they could give you one ball. And right, exactly. That, that, that was the practice. You didn't miss it. You didn't have to go pick up the ball. And that uh, became a challenge. You know, after a while, that became a challenge to say, okay, I'm not missing. You're not missing. Well, I'm sure as hell not missing. Yeah, and then yeah. we challenged each other that way in a friendly way. Yeah, no, and I think that again, and, and that, that helped me so much practicing with you guys back in the day because I didn't have that patience. Uh, and, and you went in, and it was almost like, to me, it was, it was embarrassing to miss. So right. it made me play much better in practice because I felt like I wanted to do what you guys were doing, which was making no errors. Yeah, um, likewise, the other way around to me. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking a little, pretty much about practice here. And, and so many things have happened uh, throughout the years with technology. You know, we're using a lot more things on the court with bands and cones and all this kind of stuff. So, so things are, are going in a direction that is not what it was when we were practicing. And I know that you're involved in a new product called NeuroTennis. And I'd like for you to kind of explain what that is all about. So NeuroTennis is a, is a wristband that you put on your hand that detects impact. Uh, and the two trigger points when you're hitting a tennis ball, the one trigger point is your own hit of the ball. And you have to do certain things to prepare to hit the ball. And, and uh, then you have to do certain things to recover from hitting the ball. And then I got to do things to uh, uh, prepare when you, my opponent, have hit the ball. So these two wristbands, they communicate with, with, one, with one another. So if you're wearing it and you hit your shot, my wristband is giving me a command uh, that tells me to turn my shoulders, get your racket back, move your feet, whatever I need to do to, to prepare for your hit coming my way. Now, the wristbands, what they don't know is they don't know what kind of shot you're hitting. They don't know what mistake you're making. They're only giving you a recommendation as a command to what you need to think of. And if you listen to coaches that are coaching on a court, what do the coaches do? They're telling you, move your feet, turn your shoulders, watch the ball. What did I do wrong then? I'm not sure. But you didn't move your feet. You didn't turn the shoulder. You didn't follow through. You didn't put the close stands in, on and on. So I think that when we get too technical in tennis and we try to figure out how much spin I put on the ball and we want results from a gadget, I don't think that does as much as a recommendation and what you should do to prepare for the next shot or what you should do to prepare. So uh, that's what it does. And we have different settings on it and you can set it for a forehand cross court drills. Now, now it, the, the wristband knows that we're hitting forehand cross court drills. Uh, and with a forehand cross court drill, there are 10 commands, let's say seven, eight, nine, 10 commands that are preparing you to hit a forehand cross court that are preparing you to recover towards the middle after you hit your forehand cross court. So, so again, it doesn't know what you're doing. It doesn't sense what you're doing. It only knows that you hit the ball. But I believe in positive reinforcements before you hit the ball and after you hit the ball. I believe in that more than the result of what happened to your shot. Because you can hit a great forehand standing on your heels with an open stance, open shoulders, loose wrist, whatever. You can make so many mistakes technically and still hit a great shot. That's luck. And everything with the hitting a tennis ball has to do with luck. Uh, and the impact part is luck. Uh, to Roger Federer, it's less luck than it is for me. And it's less luck for me than it is for a, a, a medium, medium uh, uh, amateur player or a junior that's 12 years old. They have more luck when it goes in. But the preparation and recovery has nothing to do with luck. You are in control, and that's what it reinforces you to do. So I would use it 
with a ball machine. I would use it uh, for a while, for 20 minutes, half an hour. And after a while, it gets really hard because it's telling you to move your feet. And I swear, the thinking is, I, I swear I'm moving my feet as much as I can, but this thing, this wristband, is telling me to move my feet more. What am I going to do? I'm going to move my feet more. Uh, uh, it seems like a wonderful thing for muscle memory, which we also know exactly. is a huge, that, uh, huge part of getting better at tennis. So that's, that's the whole great. point. That's yeah. the whole point is, is, is to uh, grow your muscle memory in a, in a positive direction. Well, that's awesome. That's, uh, good luck with that. Thank you. Uh, so you've, you've been a coach. Uh, you've been a coach on the WTA and the ATP Tour. Uh, if we take it down a level, uh, what what do you see difference in coaching girls and boys? Do you feel like there is a way to to do it differently, or? Um, I think it's. I don't necessarily think it's boys and girls. To me, uh, I try. I, I think it has to do with uh, a boy normally. Uh, relies more on his movement and his defensive skills because they're slightly quicker and stronger than the girls. But it, So it's not really a boy and girl. It's more, some players are not physically strong or quick enough to defend. And if you can't defend everywhere, then you have to play a certain style of tennis, meaning you have to take more risk when the ball is on your strings. You got to take more risk with your shot because if the ball comes back, I can't defend in both corners. And then you have the, the guy or the girl, doesn't matter, who can defend. And then you got to pay attention to when do you take a risk and when do you play it's a little bit more safe. So I think that it's, it's the, the physical mobility of the player is what determines how you coach that player. And that's why, in general, the, the ladies have a harder time defending than the men, especially on the professional tour. So that's where it differs. It was really hard to coach somebody who I didn't think had the defensive skills that I had myself. It was hard to put myself in the shoes of somebody like that. And, and that's why I think a coach really needs to understand what the player can and cannot do. And the easiest way to understand that is to have been that kind of player yourself. Yeah, yeah. that's true, true. Uh, so the questions become easier now, or maybe <laughs> not. I don't know, maybe. Um, well, if it's based what? on memory, they're harder for me. Well, you're going to have to go into memory now because <laughs> I would like to know which was your most satisfying win of your career. My most satisfying win was the finals of the French Open in 1985 uh, against Ivan Lendl. And I had lost. I, I used to beat Lendl early in my career uh, on clay every time. And he beat me on hardcore every time. And... Um, I had lost to him now for a couple of years in 85, and I played him in the finals of the French Open. I had just started losing my topspin backhand um, at a very early age. Obviously, it was still good enough. Um, most, most players would have taken it, I think. You included, Michael, uh, even when it wasn't good. But to me, myself, it was not good enough to build my point around it. So I had to start building points around my serve around coming to the net a little bit more, uh, building it around my forehand a little bit more, even though I wasn't hitting winners. And in this final specifically, I had played great getting to the finals. Um, I just switched rackets, same racket, but a different color scheme, which made the racket stiffer, which made it easier to hit forehands and first serves. And I lost the first set 6-2 or 6-3. And I remember telling myself, okay, I really don't mind losing this final but it's not going to look the same way that it did in the first set. That is out of the question. I'm so sick of losing this way. I'm sick of waiting for Lendl to hit his, his forehand big after I can't get to the backhand after 10 or 15 shots. So I decided, okay, I'm going to take uh, uh, control of things and I'm going to come into his backhand earlier and even come into his forehand. It's just not going to look the same way. And it worked. After four games in the second set, I'm up 3-1, up a break. And I, I remember saying to myself, oh my God, I'm going to win this match because he doesn't know what to do. He has yeah. never seen me play like this. And I'm coming in. And then, of course, I won easily in four sets. It was sort of 6-2, 6-3, 6-2 in the last three sets. The easiest that I've ever beaten Lendl. And then three years later, that same scenario happened in the U.S. Open final where I knew I was going to be overpowered if I kept playing the same way that I've done up to that point. And, uh, and I went back to that same thing that I'm going to slice backhands. I'm going to come to the net because I want to be in control of the point. I don't care what the scoreline looks at the end. And I happen to win both matches. And so I think the, the satisfying part is that 
I went away from my strengths and I completely went into the mode of what is Lando's weakness and I'm going to exploit that. However felt bad I felt serving and volleying on a clay court at the French Open when I was 21 years old. However bad that felt, it was feeling worse for him. And I, I think that it's awesome to hear that because I think that that is so, so important that players understand that sometimes what's most comfortable for them is not the best thing at the time. They need to be able to go to something that might not be the, their best game but it's a different way of playing. It's a different, play, uh, a different plan. I, that's a great, great answer. Thank and you I for think that. Very quickly, I think the skill lie, lies in what we talked about practice before. The skill there lies in being okay with feeling uncomfortable. I get that some players, they want to play because it's fun and they want to fight the way they think is fun. And often that is being too passive and erotic great American player, had that problem a little bit. I think we all knew, and he knew too. He needs to be more aggressive against Roger Federer. But he didn't really like doing that. He was more of a grinder, and he wants to keep the ball in play, and he hates making mistakes, move forwards. Roger Federer against Rafa Nadal, same thing. He doesn't want to miss Federer. But we all know now that, well, missing against Nadal is actually one of the best tactics there is because it doesn't give Nadal any rhythm. But, of course, Roger doesn't want to miss. So he gets no. stuck in the pattern that we are so familiar with. And then now the last three years, he hasn't because he started missing sooner. And with that brings Nadal's level down. Okay. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So we have your uh, most satisfying win. Yeah. But that might not mean that that is your best day of your tennis life. Um, no, that's true. The best day of my tennis life is uh, a day in, uh, well, there's two. Individually, it's a day in 1983 at Kuyong, Australian Open on grass. And I beat John McEnroe in singles in the quarters on grass. And I beat John McEnroe and Peter Fleming with Joachim Nystrom in doubles the same day on grass. So I had a 2-0 and against McEnroe on one day on grass. Individually, that's my best my best uh, feeling as a tennis player, for sure. But as a tennis player, I think the best feeling was winning Davis Cup in Sweden in the finals against India in doubles on clay with Joachim Nystrom because we thought there was maybe a 5% chance we lose this match. And if we lost that match, we would have still won Davis Cup the following day because we would have won one of the two singles. So I think we both knew... 100, no, 99.9%, .9%, and I'm not exaggerating, that Sweden is going to win this Davis Cup match, and we are most probably going to be the two that are winning it. So the, from the first point on, we were winning Davis Cup throughout the whole doubles, and the fun we had doing points and between points, it was hysterical to play such a big match knowing that we were winning Davis Cup while we were at it. That's my uh -huh. best thing ever. I remember that week. That was a good time overall, I must say. That was a good time overall. <laughs> that, was yeah. good, that. that was a good time. And I got to ask you too. Do you the ever, whole week was like that, right? That, the, whole week, yeah. the whole week oh, yeah. was not like that. We were yeah. winning Davis Cup from the first moment we stepped on uh, into the practice week. And we were winning until the, it, the end. It was a week-long winning Davis Cup. That, that's great. Uh, I just got to ask you, do you ever remind McEnroe about those two wins on the same day? No, I haven't reminded. I think he would tell me that he tanked the doubles uh, because he lost in singles. So, so I don't really want to remind him because I don't want to. I don't want to believe for a moment that he didn't try in the doubles. I know he didn't because uh, uh, we would never beaten him if he did. But uh, I'm trying to lie to myself and thinking that he did try really hard. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I have one last question for you, Mats, and, and I yep. think that in, in hearing your answers here about practice and and to a certain extent you talk about matches. Uh, what would you say made you as successful as you were and are? Um, I think my strength lies in being able to uh, focus a hundred percent of what I am and uh, what I am enjoying at the moment. And I think it, it doesn't matter if it's if it's uh, practicing tennis while being a pro or playing a match while being a pro or commentating for Eurosport. Uh, I feel that I have always followed uh, 
my passion and some of my passions have not made any money whatsoever, but it's still been a job. And some of my passions have made me uh, uh, a bit of money and given me a, a bit of success. Uh, and it's my job or they have never been my job. I'm not sure, but I've been lucky enough where I'm able to pursue what I enjoy in life. And I think I'm able to put my soul and heart into what I'm doing. Um, hopefully the same as what just happened in this interview, Michael. Yeah, no, and I, I think uh, that's wonderful to hear as well. And I, uh, I want to thank you so very much. Thank it you. Was, it was great talking to you. Uh, I hope to see you soon. And, uh, you know, if things can calm down in this crazy world, we get to go out there and uh, play some tennis again and maybe some golf. Huh? I love to do both and a pleasure being part of uh, a very cool name, Open Mike. Yeah, I get it. I get All it. Right. All right. <laughs> thank you, Michael. <laughs> hey, Matt, take care. Stay love the family. All I will best. do that too. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.